I think half a year or so before moving on to Jülich uh, and became later on professor in Tübingen and now he's professor in Göttingen. I would say what you can say from many papers in Russian uh, where people say whenever you find some theoretically, probably some Russian physicists already published that in the 60s or 70s. You can also say that from here. If you discover something in Preston's microscopy, you should probably look up whether Jörg already published it 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, having said that, uh, I think he's really one of the outstanding figures in our field, and it's a great pleasure uh, that you give a presentation here in this audience. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jörg. Yeah, thank you, Gerhard, very much for this very flattering introduction. So I hope I can live up to this expectation here. So my, my topic today will be matter and use energy transfer, and I will try to guide you step by step uh, through the through the topic and what's about. So I mean, we are we have seen today already very nice talks about super resolution microscopy, and mostly the the the, 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 the speech was about the lateral resolution. And of course, when we when we look uh, in the textbooks and we find this very famous other resolution of the lateral resolution limit in diffraction limited uh, optical microscopy, which simply tells us, okay. When we, when we take, let's say, with a wide field microscope, a fluorescence image, then the resolution is limited by something like the wavelength of light divided by two times the refractive index of our sample. And then sine theta, which is uh, where theta is the half angle of light collection of our objective. And there is a very nice, I will not go into detail here, but there's a very nice, simple way to derive this equation by looking at the interference pattern of two coherent emitters and then simply looking, okay, when is my objective not capable any longer to capture this interference pattern when the, when the emitters come too close. But there's also a very similar resolution limit when you look along the optical axis. Of course, in the wide field microscope, as you all know, doesn't have this, this kind of confocal sectioning, but that's why people invented the confocal microscope. And then you can ask, okay, what is the resolution limit along the optical axis? For example, for the standard confocal microscope, and you will find a very similar relation, which is not so, 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 so popular, but um, also basically based on hard Fourier optics. And it tells you, okay, if my two emitters along the optical axis, optical axis are closer than the wavelength of light divided by the refractive index, and then one minus cosine this half angle of light collection, um, then also again, we lose the capability to resolve structures below this, this limit. So this is interestingly, I mean, um, and what, okay, and what you can then calculate quite easily when you compare these two numbers, the lateral resolution and the axial resolution, you will find that there's always some kind of discrepancy factor three to five. That, that means when you, for example, look at the normal confocal 3D image, you will always see that, that the image looks somehow distorted along the optical axis because the resolution on the optical axis is by a factor of three to five worse than uh, laterally, lateral resolution. This is also interestingly conveyed to, to most of the super resolution methods. Let's, let's say when we, when we talk about something like, uh, yeah, I did not mention the step microscopy, but also sort of standard step microscopy, but also in palm storm microscopy, when you do single molecule localization, you have the same mismatch between the excellent lateral resolution. Typically, the typical methods we use, for example, in these palm storm methods for, for 3D imaging is asigmatic imaging or biplane, or now this, these newer phase imaging methods, or recently these very nice work by, by Schechtmann and Mörner, this voice function engineering approaches. But again, we are then limited to something like 30 to 50 nanometer along the optical axis. Of course, there are also developments beyond that. And this is something like interferometric palm or isostat, where you use two objectives to look at your sample from two sides. And then you use very complex interferometric tricks to, to, to increase resolution. Or recently, I think we will hear today from, from, from Francisco, the 3D also minflux. You then can really get down to isotropic and one nanometer resolution. But of course, as you all know, these methods are nice, but they are hyper complex. So I mean, um, let's see how it develops. Also, there are first uh, also commercial minflux systems now out there. But I mean, I think still it's quite quite hard for many of us to operate them. There are also other methods which I only mentioned here: cursory, the supercritical angle fluorescence imaging or SAF imaging, which, for example, was pioneered by by Jonas Ries and, and Tom, Thomas Ruckstuhl. Um, also, variable angle to the internal fluorescence microscopy, where you can go down to something like 10 nanometer along the optical axis, which is also remarkable. But I mean, they are mostly intensity based, and they, they have other problems. 
So we were thinking, okay, can we come up with a simple approach to, to the third dimension, which is really easy to use and very robust. And uh, the whole idea is based on the, uh, on the electrodynamics of single molecule fluorescence emission. So when you when you look at an excited uh, fluorescent molecule, which is about to emit light, then this, this system can be very nicely described by this ideal picture of an electric oscillating electric dipole, where you have a positive and negative charge, you have an oscillation amplitude and frequency, of course, and also orientation, the dipole orientation of your emitter. And then when you put this into Maxwell's equations, this really old stuff uh, from the 19th century, then you find the so-called Hertz dipole emission. And what you see here is the electric field intensity about your around your dipole emitter. So the dipole axis is here along the vertical axis, and this is then the, the emission in, into, into the far field. What is interesting when you look here, there is basically nothing here to see. So indeed, there is no far field emission along the, optic, also along the axis of your dipole. The maximum emission is in the in the in the plane of orthogonal, orthogonal to your dipole axis, and then in between you have this famous sine squared theta law. The, this is quite classical and uh, physics, so nothing new here. But this, the story becomes more interesting when you put your molecule close to an interface. Let's say we have here our single emitter. We, we put it close to a reflecting interface or partially reflecting interface. So what is now happening is your emitter is starting to emit light, and then something really uh, fascinating happens, this light is partially reflected back and uh, indeed uh, this can then influence the emission of, your, of the emitter itself. So the emitter basically is interacting with its mirror image in this reflecting, in this reflecting mirror here and this is modulating the emission and, and in several very interesting ways. And the first thing I want simply to show you here is that what, what you, for example, change is the completely this, the angular distribution of emission. So what you see here are two uh, calculations, so theoretical predictions. What is happening when you put your fluorescent dipole, which let's say is in the air, uh, when you put it on the surface of a glass cover slip. Um, and then what, what, uh, what, what this animation here is showing is then the angular distribution of emissions. So how much light your emitter, also if you of course repeatedly excite it and then look at the photon flux. So how much light from your emitter is emitted into which uh, um, direction uh, in space. And what, what you can see is that the presence of our glass cover slip here is completely changing the simple picture of the Hertz dipole in a hom homogeneous environment as we have seen before. You get a very complex angular distribution and then this is something we then uh, did many years ago. Then by using a very simple setup where we look at these emitters with a defocused wide field microscope. So we are on purpose, we are defocusing the optics so that every emitter gets a blurred uh, image pattern. Then you can then read out this angular distribution of emission indeed by looking at the, at the, de at the defocused emission patterns of a molecule. And this is shown here. And to show you also, it's not only theory, and this is one of the best examples of such an experiment um, I have seen so far this is from Hiroshi Ushi, who is a professor in Leuven. And what you see here are fluorescent molecules embedded in a very thin polymer film, so they cannot diffuse away anymore, so they are trapped in, in, in polymer cavities, but they still can rotate and you can recognize indeed that we find here exactly these defocuses images as, as, as you have seen before in the theoretical prediction. But this is not the only thing which is changed and modulated by the presence of this kind of a mirror. You can even go further. You can increase the reflectivity of your surface, for example, by putting something like a thin silver film on your glass cover slide. And what is then also changed tremendously is the fluorescence lifetime, so like say a solid state lifetime of the molecule. So what you see here in the far field, this is simply the self-interference of your molecule with its image in the mirror, but then when you come very close to your to your surface or so in the near field range here, this is something like a, 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 a twenty percent or ten percent of the lifetime, also of the of the of the wavelength of light. Then you see that you have this very dramatic quenching of the fluorescence. Uh, connected with the lifetime decrease, which is due to coupling of the excited state energy to plasmons in your metal film. This is a near field coupling to plasmons in the metal film. So why is it now interesting for microscopy? Because some years ago, we came to the idea, can we not use this, this effect, this very strong modulation of the lifetime as a function of the distance from a metal surface? Can we not use it for localizing something? So it's a somehow crazy idea. So what you do is you do a temporal measurement. So you measure the fluorescence lifetime, and then you convert this lifetime information into a, into a spatial distance. So this is the general idea. 
And there are some subtle things to consider. The first thing is that, of course, there's this coupling, this new field coupling of your, of your excited state molecule to the plasmon is also orientation dependent. This is important to, 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 to take into account. So for example, here you see then three curves. The black curve is for a molecule which has a horizontal orientation with respect to the surface. Then the vertical, the red curve is for the vertical orientation when it is perpendicular to the surface. And then the blue curve is the random orientation. Fortunately enough, I can directly tell you in most examples and what we consider, what we studied so far in our lab, um, our, the, 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 the fluorescent molecule is relatively flexible in its orientation because it is linked by a linker to the target of interest. And it is still leaving enough flexibility that, that the random curve is a very good proxy of the real situation. So let's assume the blue curve is the, the right one. Then we can use this kind of theoretical prediction here and convert the lifetime into a distance. And this is the first experiment what we did then some years ago was to, to look at uh, the plasma membrane of, of cells. So we, we simply labeled the cell membrane here with fluorescent dyes. We put our cells in on the surface of a cover slide, which was coated with a very thin gold film. So thicknesses in the order of 10 nanometers, which means that indeed it is basically quasi-transparent. Um, you don't lose much light. However, this very thin gold film is enough for this uh, ex excited state plasmon coupling and is in, indeed in using this very strong fluorescence dependence as a fluorescence lifetime dependence on the distance. And then we use a standard uh, scanning confocal microscope uh, with pulse excitation, which is capable of fluorescence lifetime imaging. So what we have here is an excitation laser which is giving you a pulse frame with 50 picosecond pulse uh, width and, and something like 20 to 80 megahertz. Then we have here a single photon avalanche diet for, for collecting the single photons. And then of course, you need a high speed electronics for then calculating uh, these, these arrival times of your photons with respect to the laser pulses. And this is then the standard confocal fluorescence lifetime imaging microscope. So, we were, so that is very similar to what people do in film. The only modification here is this gold film. So what we then can do, we take a intensity image, of course, but we also have to first this lifetime image. And then we do, because we relatively nicely now the theoretical dependence of lifetime versus distance, we can then convert the lifetime information into a distance information. And one of the very first experimental examples was, was this year, where we looked at the basal membrane of MECT2 cells uh, spreading on the surface or moving on the surface. Um, and uh, what you see here, this false color is the height map. Yeah, so please pay attention to this, the scale here. So that directly shows you indeed, wow, yeah, we have a much, much higher now uh, resolution, longer optical axis than laterally. Of course, here with this normal confocal scanning microscope, the lateral resolution is not improved at all. So it's still the diffraction limit. But now that the axial resolution is by orders of magnitude better than what you would not normally have in a normal, in a normal confocal microscope. Of course, the question is, okay, how, how accurate is it? How good is it? So what we did, we did calibration measurements. So we prepared samples where we have our glass cover slip uh, coated here with the gold film. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was too fast. Uh, let's go back. Um, yeah, I have to click my cursor here, yeah. And then what we did, we put on top of our gold films, uh, spacer layer silicon dioxide with a very well known, well measured thickness. So we changed from 20, 30, 40, 50 nanometer. And then on top of that, we have a super thin film of only a few nanometers with dyed polymer film. And this is then simply the sample, which we then use for calibration. And what you see here is the calibration curve, which simply tells you, okay, what is the dependence in the, in the precision of our axial localization as a function of the fluorescence, as a number of fluorescence photons we have collected per spot. And what you see here is that, let's say, when we have something like five to 10,000 photons per scan position, then you get a result solution or precision of, of localization in the order of two to four nanometers. So I think this is quite remarkable in the end. Let me repeat it. What we do is simply a fluorescence lifetime measurement, nothing more. And this gives us then the spatial information of the position of the fluorescent entity along the optical axis. So one of the first biological applications I want to show you here was that we looked at uh, simply reorganization of these uh, epithelial cells into meth and chymal cells. This is a transition you can induce it biochemically. Um, and what you then see is, and what we then did here, we labeled the actin, actin cytoskeleton, and we looked simply at the organization of this actin cytoskeleton, actin cytoskeleton inside the cell in the transition period. This is here in ours. Again, these are live cell measurements. And the interesting point is here indeed that 
when you when you when you induce this this transition here from a material state to mesenchymal state, you would indeed see that that uh, that you are basically your your <coughs> um, boundary uh, actin cladded boundary of your cell is somehow lifting up by something like 20, 10, 20 nanometers, which would be completely mostly un unmeasurable with, with other methods, at least not in light in, in living cells. So I think it was very encouraging. Then the next thing what we did, we wanted to go further. We wanted to do not only single color, but we wanted to do dual color to co-localize stuff. So then we came to dual color mite experiments. So we call it the metal induced energy transfer imaging. And here is an example for the focal adhesion complex where we uh, labeled uh, with two different dyes, the actin and the vinculant filaments. And again, what you see here is then the height maps of these filaments. Filaments and uh, let me go to the next slide and to show you some 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 traces here. So we then picking individual filaments here one two three, and then you see here the height map for the actin. This is the actin trace here, and this is the, the uh, this is the um, this is then the the, the vinculin trace here, and you see then very nicely okay there is a distance between these two protein complexes of roughly 20 nanometer, but also please pay attention to the very shallow angle here. So we have here a range about uh, so over nine micrometers, and we see it. Sorry, okay, and we see a change here. Uh, of only some 10 to 20 nanometers um, going up of, of the filament. Say the same here again for other cell samples. So I mean, it's again showing you the extreme sensitivity and, 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 and high resolution along the optical axis of this method. One of my most favorite examples is shown here. This is the nuclear envelope. As you all will know, the nuclear envelope has this, basically the bi-membrane system. You have an outer and an inner nuclear membrane. Um, and the distance between the outer and the inner membrane is really small. So a normal, normal microscopy will be really hard to, to, uh, to resolve. I mean, and maybe you can do it with a super resolution single molecule localization here in this region, but certainly not here along the optical axis. So again, what we did, you will do a column might so be labeled uh, inside the lab to beta protein with one flu four, and outside we, we took one of the proteins in the nuclear pore complex and labeled it with another dye, a red dye. And then again, did this mite business. So we measured the first lifetime and then calculated then the distances from, from the surface. The good thing now here is that we can then get a high difference between the inner and the outer labeling. And this is shown here. And let's first focus on the left side where we have six different cells. And this is then the, the measured height difference or the distance between the inner and the outer nuclear membrane. And we find the number in the order of 30 to 35 nanometers. And then we did also something for, for checking that we, we have any bias in our measurements. So we switched the order of the, the dice. It means then here in this, in the switch sample, the, the, the green dye is outside and red dye is inside. And we find again the same numbers back, which was very encouraging and show, showing us that we, that we have no, no, that is a systematic bias in these mic measurements. Um, one of the latest uh, applications I want to show you here, this is the co collaboration with the group from Sarah Cuesta here in, in Göttingen, and they are interested in looking at the spreading of blood platelets on the surface. So blood platelets are highly dynamic uh, cells, which, which have uh, extremely rapid uh, dynamics when, when you look at that. This is here an intensity image showing you what is happening when a blood platelet lands on the surface. It is starting to spread extremely rapidly over the surface and, and then building these, these Philopodia here, and we wanted to see also whether we can then get information about the height. So we did and then again these lifetime measurements uh, using a very rapid scanning system. This is now really the speed is now really the big thing. So we used a new system developed by by Pibocon, uh, in Berlin for doing super rapid flim images, and then use these flim images again to get lifetime information, and then to, to look at the height. And the result is shown here, and you also can read it up in, in this in this very nice publication here, Nanoscale. Um, again, we, we have the spreading here, and then we can, for example, really see that the height. In the, again, in the range of only a few nanometers is going down when a cell is, is landing on the surface and then spreading over the surface. So we can nicely follow not only the lateral spreading of the cells, but also the, the height of the membrane <coughs> going down then in, in, in these measurements. Um, of course, the question is, okay, I mean, we have the gold on, on the cover slide. No? This is, of course, here. And of course, the gold will absorb some light. So the question was, is it, is it, is it really detrimental or can we, how far can we go in sensitivity? Is it possible with this kind of method also to look at single molecules? 
So that was then the next step to do these experiments with really single molecules in, in, in our samples. So we prepared again artificial samples where we had in very uh, sparse uh, concentration here, single molecules in the air on a spacer of known thickness. And then again, we, we changed the thickness value here and then made systematic measurements. The results are shown here, and there are several things you can learn from these images. So this is with a 20 nanometer spacer, 30, 40, and 50. The color here is giving you the lifetime again, it's a lifetime axis. And the first thing what you see instantly is, indeed, even if we only change our distance of our molecules on the surface in steps of 10 nanometer, it is even with, with the BRI, it is clearly visible how the lifetime is changing. This is good. The second thing is also that when you look at these individual spots here, that the signal to noise and ratio is quite, quite formidable. So indeed, even if gold is absorbing some part of the light, some in the order of 20 to maybe 30, 30%, the signal to noise is still great enough to see easily single molecules into single molecule localization. And of course, one of the things we are now looking into is to combine this MITE single molecule MITE imaging with, with the normal single molecule localization microscopy to get 3D information combining MITE with, with SMLM. So how is, again, what is the accuracy here? So here, this, these are histograms of the lifetime distributions for the four different samples. Again, remind, remind you 20, 30, 40, and 50 nanometers. Um, the, the width of these distributions, again, give us a proxy for also how, how good the localization accuracy is for these kinds of measurements of 2.5 nanometer and a typical the number of photons detected per molecule was in the order of 8,000 photons, which is very nicely in, 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 in accordance with the calibration measurement I have shown you before. So why is it now very, very nice and interesting? The next step that we wanted to do is not simply localizing single molecules uh, on, on an artificial sample, but the question was, can we use now MITE also for co-localizing things uh, in space in, along the third axis. So what we did, is was a collaboration with uh, Philip Tinnefeld and Munich now. So they prepared for us these very nice so-called 3D origami rockets. So these are complex three-dimensional origami DNA origami structures. We can orient, we can, uh, uh, in an oriented manner, we can mobilize them on the surface so that we exactly now not only where they are, but also what's the orientation of them. Then at different vertical positions, we can mobilize at specific sites than uh, fluorescent fluores molecule. In this case, what ATO 647N. And then what we did is, this is a typical example here, we, we, we focus on one spot and then we are bleaching away all the molecules. So in the beginning, of course, all three emitters are alive. Then the first is bleaching away, the second is bleaching away, and then in the end, we have here only the background. And then we can go back in our data file and then for each of these molecules uh, individually, we can then extract the first lifetime. So what you see here are then the different lifetime curves for the three individual molecules. And these are the lifetime values that we fit. Of course, the shortest lifetime is the molecule which is closest to our gold surface and the, the biggest, the, the largest lifetime is the molecule which is far, far away from the molecule. And of course, again, we can then compare with what, what we now from this construction of the origami and uh, then we find that we have a very nice correspondence between the measured heights and, and the design heights. Uh, we also saw, by the way, that, that uh, the real origami was a little bit smaller than you would expect. And this is indeed then was also then confirmed by atomic force microscopy that the design, design distances here in the origami are a little bit shorter in reality due to salt effects, uh, whatever. And this, uh, this was also very nice confirmation that our method is really sensitive to see in very subtle and small changes along the optical axis. Um, but this was at the end of the story because we wanted to go further. So I mean, one of the big things in our group is uh, studying or looking at, at membranes, lipid membranes, because I think the uh, biomembrane biophysics is super exciting. And of course, in, in, when you look at a single membrane, then we are talking about something like five nanometer thickness values here along the optical axis. So what you see here is a schematic of a supported lipid membrane on the surface. And let's say you want really to distinguish whether your emitter is sitting in the, in, the, in the lower leaflet or the upper leaflet here in your membrane, then we are talking about the distance change of only five nanometers. So of course, we could again use our gold uh, metal stuff for, for doing metal induced energy transfer imaging. But then the, the difference in lifetime here over these five nanometers is something like 100 picoseconds. 
And this is really getting difficult to, to, to measure and then to use, especially when you have emitters in both leaflets simultaneously. So when you have a mixture of these both uh, emitters here and then you want to disentangle this mixture by using lifetime, this is how very challenging. So we were looking for alternatives. Can we use something else than this metal? And we found it then um, in, 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 a, in a new material, which is quite popular now in physics. This is graphene. So as you all may know, graphene is this kind of hexagonal arrangement of, of carbon atoms in, in, a, in a single sheet uh, um, 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 geometry. And uh, graphene basically acts similar to a metal as a gigantic uh, energy absorber for, for, for light. So basically what you have here is then something like a gigantic uh, infinitely extended uh, molecule, which is, which is acting like, a, like an and like the acceptor in a threat ex experiment. So the emitter is the donor and the graphene is the acceptor. And in that case, uh, the interesting thing is that now the dynamic range, so the fluorescence lifetime change over, over length is much smaller and much steeper, of course. Now we have now here something like the 25 to 30 nanometer before we reach then the free space lifetime. And uh, this gives off, of course, a much higher accuracy when we convert the lifetime into a distance. Of course, the dynamic range is also reduced, but uh, the, the accuracy is going up uh, accordingly. What is also important to mention here, I did not, not point it out before, that uh, our metal induced energy transfer is not only depending on the orientation, as you see here. Again, we show here the blue curve for the, for the perpendicular orientation, the red curve for the horizontal orientation, but it also depends on the quantum yield of fluorescence. So this is all the one quantity we have to know a priori. You need a quantum, quantum um, yield of fluorescence then for doing these calculations. But and this is showing here what the, how it is shifting from, from a molecule with quantum yield one to a molecule with only 10% quantum yield. So this is a typical range we are working with. So again, we did um, calibration measurements. We wanted to, to know, okay, how sensitive is it now? This is now really single molecule uh, metal induced energy transfer where we use uh, single R655 molecules again on artificial samples with, with spacers on top of the graphene of, of known thickness. Now the range is much smaller. So we are talking here about 10, 15, and 20 nanometer. And we will see this is a single molecule lifetime curve that indeed there is a tremendous change in the lifetime now when you even move your molecule only a few nanometer up and down. So this was very nice. So then we said, okay, let's now do the real samples. So what we did next is we then prepared supported lipid bilayers on top of our graphene substrate. And then we labeled uh, both, uh, both sides, so the head groups of, of both the lipids and both sides, we labeled them with, with, with fluorescent dye. And then we did not a single molecule experiment, but really then measured for a long time by scanning, simply by scanning uh, con confocal microscopy, we measured then tons of, of light from, from the sample to get really good signal. Um, the calibration curve is shown here. It was also quite interesting because now I will tell you in, in a minute, our accuracy becomes so high that we have even to take into account that uh, for the dyes uh, on, the, on the top leaflet, there is still a lipid bilayer between, between the dye and the graphene, which is slightly changing this fluorescence lifetime versus distance dependency. So this, these are, that's why you see here two curves. It's a minute effect, but you will see it makes, it makes a difference. So what you see here, the red curve is uh, when you have the, the dye, when you have the, 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 um, the, when, the, the when the lipid is, is, is above the dye, and here is when the lipid is below the dye. Um, and no, or maybe I think it's confusing, but this is the difference. Uh, you see, the, the difference here is when the when the, the dye is on different sides of the lipid bilayer. So how is now the measurement looking like? So what you see now here on the left side. There's a diagram here we show now the fitted, this is already the fitted fluorescence uh, decay values. It's a bi-exponential decay because of course now in our bilayer with dyes in the top and the bottom leaflet, we see always that we have a bi-exponential decay in the fluorescence. So what you see here is now a histogram basically of the fitted decay values. Here's the long lifetime, here's the short lifetime as in the dependence on the number of photons. So what it, what it simply shows you that when you have only something like 10,000 photons in your total, in your total uh, fluorescence decay curve, of course, and the fitting becomes 
uh, becomes uh, error prone. You have, of course, then simply short noise and whatever. So it means when you repeat the experiment many thousand times, then you see these two distributions, see this distribution of lifetimes for the short lifetime value is a distribution of lifetime for the, for the long lifetime value. But when you collect more photons here, 100,000, 1 million, 10 million, then basically the accuracy of your lifetime fitting becomes uh, infinitely big. I mean, of course, there is some, some short noise limit in the end, but, but you see then the accuracy of lifetime fitted becomes to something in the picosecond time range. And then you can convert these numbers here, these fitted lifetime values into distances. And this is shown here. So this is then basically the distance here of my dice in the top leaflet from the surface. And this is the distance of my dice in the bottom leaflet from the surface in nanometers now here. And here, this gap, this is exactly what I was talking before. This is exactly the influence in the, of the limit bilayer in the beam. Yeah, it's really then inducing this gap here in these two, in these two diagrams here when we convert a lifetime into a distance. And yeah, there's a jump basically because there is for the top, for the top leaflet, there is this extra lipid bilayer, which is shifting somehow slightly uh, the mite calibration curve. So how accurate is it, is it going? So what we did here, is we compared two different uh, lipid compositions. This is DOPC and DLPC. Um, they have different uh, chain lengths. Uh, so we, we expect that also the thickness of the bilayer is different. And then we have the bottom and top distance, which is not so super exciting, but the difference is the important number. So for the DOPC, we see something like 5.5 nanometer. And for the DLPC, something like 4 of Point of four nanometer, and please pay attention to this accuracy. This is really by simply by by repeating the measurement many times and then estimating the standard deviation. We can then estimate what is the accuracy of the of the localization of the of the, the, the also of the distance of the thickness measurement of these bio layers, and we find it something in the in the Angstrom range. Uh, but it's also important, we compared, of course, our measurements with, with SACS measurements. So people have measured uh, the head group distances in these bilayers with small angle and X-ray scattering, and they find the number of 4.6 here and 3.3. And of course, our numbers are bigger because the, we are measuring the distances between dice, which are attached to the head groups by a short linker. So the, the numbers have to be bigger and they are quite reasonable. So this is something like nine angstrom bigger than this number. Here we have a difference of something like six angstrom, seven angstrom, sorry, which is reasonably number for the, for the extra length of linker and also the dye position. What was also interesting to us that we see a relatively uh, large thickness of the hydration layer below the, 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 the bilayer. Uh, this is in our case something here, for example, DOPC 1.8 nanometer. Um, or this, you see the, the distances here. The, the 1.8 nanometer comes from, from again, from, from X-ray scattering. And uh, this was somehow in the beginning unexpected for us because I did not expect that we see so much water below the subwater bilayer. But this is indeed confirmed also by, by, by X-ray. Uh, so where it goes next, one uh, project in progress I want to show you here. I, I really like it very much. This is basically done by, by Sufi uh, Raja and Arindam Ghosh. Um, Arindam is now both of our group. Sufi is in, in Duke University in the group of Christoph Schmidt. So it's really their work. Um, um, mostly but what they came up with is that they wanted to look at uh, mitochondria membrane organization. So the idea is the following. You, you, as a Sufi has a very nice technique to isolate individual mitochondria and to create them on a surface. Again, we use here graphene as the quencher in our mud experiments. We have here poly l -Lysen for then uh, electrostatically attaching our mitochondria to the surface. Um, and then we have uh, two different labels. The one is this uh, mitotracker deep red, which is labeling the inner surface here, the inner membrane of our mitochondria. And then we also use a fluorescent protein here, mcoline free from uh, then labeling the, 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 tom, the 20 complex in the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And again, what you want to see or what we're interested in, okay, it can be measured somehow the average distance uh, between these two dyes. Of course, here it's only an average value, but, but because as you will now, now, mitochondria have these very um, elaborate crystal systems, so the, the inner membrane is very convoluted, so it's not a planar or somehow planar, planar system. So we can only then measure the mean distance between the inner dice and the outer dice, but still, we wanted to see whether we can do it. And what we also did, we used, uh, we, we prepared our mitochondria in two different states, in a resting state, where so in the buffer there is nothing they can use for uh, ATP synthesis, and then we have an activated state where we add a buffer which is containing pyruvate, malate, and ADP for then in, in, inducing uh, ADP synthesis. And what you see here is then the, the inner membrane uh, 
basically uh, lifetime images or the height images or you convert it to height images and here's the outer membrane for different uh, mitochondria here's only one mitochondrium here are several mitochondria so we did it for many uh, so for several of them so 35 and what we then find is for example here then is the is the distance of the inner membrane to the surface so what you see here is a histogram of the inner membrane distance to the surface in the active state and the resting state and you find that in the resting state, on, on average, the dyes in the inner membrane, they are something like 2 to 2.5 nanometers farther away from the surface than in the, in the active state when the mitochondrion starts to, to do ATP uh, synthesis. When we look at the outer membrane, we don't see any change. This is very nice. So it means that we indeed, when we add our respiration buffer and induce uh, action in, of ATP synthesis, that uh, the, the, the intermembrane distance is somehow reduced from 12.5 to something like 10 nanometer. And we see this very subtle change, which is an indication that indeed upon ATP synthesis, there is a reorganization of the inner membrane that this day are probably getting flatter and the roughness is getting smaller and we see a reduction in the intermembrane volume in the, in, the, in the mitochondria. Let me basically conclude my talk with another very nice work we have done. I mean, this is the work of Jakob Kieler and Shang Jian Yu in, in Osnabrück. So I only contribute some theoretical stuff here. So it's really their work. And that's why I only to give you the paper here. And they looked at the, with, with graphene might, they looked at the dynamic multi-protein complexes in membranes. It's a very nice work. It's a very extensive work. And you can see there also again that the, with might, they were able to resolve super subtle changes in protein uh, complex organ organization in the order of a few nanometers only. Yeah, this is, I can really strongly recommend to look at this paper, but I will not tell you much about it here because this is really their work and I only contribute some theoretical stuff. Let me finish that with two basically announcements. The first one, okay, how difficult is it to use for somebody not in our lab? I mean, you need, of course, you need a fluorescence uh, lifetime imaging microscope. This is mostly now available in many labs. You need these cold covers as a cold coated cover slides or graphene cover, cover, cover slides. Basically, the graphene stuff you can meanwhile buy already from many companies. The goal we do in house here in our clean room, clean room, but basically any university with a clean room facility can make these cover slides quite easily. What is more important is then the, the data evaluation, of course. It is quite, uh, can be quite sophisticated. You, you need also a lot of uh, information like emission spectra the free space lifetime, the quantum yield. Uh, but if you have all the data and then the measurements, then you can, then we have uh, our open source might GUI available. You can download it from our website. You can feed in the data and then this program is returning you then the height map or distances of whatever you look at. So this is quite, I mean, we are trying to make it quite convenient for users. Um, also, I mean, this is some really small technical stuff. We also did some dead pattern correction in film when you, when you do high, high intensity film images where then that time of detectors and electronics is, is important. We came up with a nice correction for that. And last but not least, let me also simply hint at a few papers here <coughs> where we invented a I think a very nice method using a very simple nano cavity. It's really simple to assemble and to use for measuring quantum yields of, of uh, fluorescent, uh, fluorescent molecules in, in solution, which is super important for our MITE stuff because MITE really depends on a good knowledge of the quantum yield. And you may know that even when you, when you know the quantum yield of a pure dye, when you conjugate a dye, for example, against a protein, the quantum yield can change. So that this one prerequisite we need to measure the quantum yield of our dyes in the presence of the targets you want them to measure in the might, uh, in the might measurement. So with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I have to thank, of course, my group in Göttingen, especially the, the guys which are listed here and all, all our collaborator, collaborators here. This is Andreas Janssov in the chemistry department. Ralf Kielenbach in the biology department. This was the work with the nuclear envelopes. Sarah Köster was the, the blood platelets. Florian Rehfeld was the, um, in the focal adhesion complex. Christoph Schmidt uh, is involved in the, in the work <coughs> with, the, with the mitochondria and Shang Jian Yu and Jakob Pila, as I have shown you, was this multi-protein complex work. And I have to thank all the, the, fine, the fine, fine, financial support uh, which, which you see here. And thank you for your attention. Thank, thanks, Jörg, for this fantastic talk. Uh, paper is open for questions now. Let's Oh, please activate your cameras again so that we can see each other. <coughs> uh, 
Alex, you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, York, for this.